Uh, just so you know, this is the first time for a while, we're doing a book by book Bible overview series in our evening services. And um, when I kind of became pastor here about six months ago now, um, one of the, um, the, the charges in the profile of the hopes was to, to become more biblical, become more worshipful. And the, the biblical, um, I, I felt like if we were just to do a, a book by book Bible overview, then we're immersing ourselves as God's people in his story. What could be better than that um, in bringing the, the, the story of the Bible to life in our lives? So that's why we're in uh, what we're in this evening. And we've been progressing quite well. So we're in two kings uh, this evening. Um, you've had a few weeks because we missed last week. Has anybody managed to read some of two kings? The whole of it? Yes, we've got, some, we've got a few hands, actually. Hold it to Well done. Well done. Well, if you haven't, then there you go. There's your challenge for this week. Although we'll then be moving on. So one Chronicles as well. Hey-ho. Um, right. Messy. That is how I would describe the book of Two Kings. And um, in one sense, it's not too dissimilar from the world today. I remember when I was first uh, prepping this overview um, series and this particular book a few years ago now because I've preached this series before um, I remember thinking wow the world's messy uh, you've got Tories fighting Labour Tories fighting Tories you've got <laughs> Republicans fighting Democrats Republicans fighting Republicans and that's just in the political realm our lives are messy as well loads of infighting not just in our families but in our own hearts different voices we're, we're no less messy today than the world during the 7th and 6th centuries BC, which is when most of two kings uh, happens. So it's important we learn lessons from history. And if you remember back two weeks when we were engaging with one kings, um, I said one and two kings were originally one book. And I've, I've looked into some of the history. There's no reason either biblically or extra-biblically, as to why they were split in two. I think the most likely reason, considering they're both about the same length, is you would have needed a really long scroll to write the whole of one and two kings on one piece of parchment. And so there's, there's two scrolls. It means, though, that when we come to two kings, it starts with a bang, because if you think about it, we're starting in the middle of the book. So it starts with... Chapter um, 1, verse 1, 2 Kings. King Ahazahiah, Ahazahiah of Israel, he falls from the second floor chamber. Um, that's always going to hurt. Um, earlier on in the series in Jonah, I was talking about um, if you've ever had to walk up in an attic on floorboards. And uh, in one translation, it says that Ahazahiah um, fell through the lattice. So it, it could be like our modern equivalent of walking on an attic today, not knowing where to stand. He falls through. Anyway, he really hurts himself. And then he's in this place of recovery. How can I recover as quickly as possible? What does he do? Terrible start of a book all about an Israelite king. He says, chapter one, verse two, tells some of his servants, go inquire of Baal Zebob, the god of Ekron, whether I shall recover from this sickness. As a start, it's a terrible start, isn't it? For, for a book about God's people, you have the king of Israel, the king of God's people at the time, starting by going to another god, small g, because only our God deserves big G, capital G, to see whether that small g God can help. Uh, you don't have to be a rocket scientist, to recognize the tone of what comes next. This is God speaking, verses 3 and 4 of chapter 1. God challenges this king and he says, Is it because there's no God in Israel that you are going to inquire of Baal-zebub, the God of Ekron? Now, therefore, says the Lord, you shall not come down from the bed to which you've gone up, but you shall surely die. Friends, the beginning of a very, very messy book, which, unsurprisingly depicts the downfall of the divided kingdom. If you remember back in 1 Kings, um, 1 and 2 Samuel said there was a united kingdom when everybody was together and then they divided into the northern kingdom of Israel, southern kingdom of Judah. And here we have the downfall of the divided kingdom. Israel first destroyed by the Assyrians. We read about that in chapter 17. 
And then the book ends about 100 years later with Judah, the southern kingdom, being taken into exile by the Babylonians. That's the history. That's probably as deep as I'm going to go in the broad brushstrokes history. For the sake of simplicity, tonight I'm going to focus on just two lessons I think jump out from the text. First lesson, God's grace abounds in unlikely places. Hallelujah to that. God's grace abounds in unlikely places. Elisha, the prophet, he features quite heavily in much of the first third of the book. And it's worth noting that many of the prophets who wrote books, which feature in the Old Testament, lived during the days of of this book, Two Kings. However, we only really read about um, Isaiah, who wrote a book. Elisha didn't, but we read about him as well. Prophets like Amos, Hosea, Micah, Jeremiah, they're not even mentioned. And we ask questions why. It could be that the narrator is solely focusing on the history. It could be that he's making a point of the lack of spiritual fervor at the time. I think that's probably more likely. Really messy place at this point in history. A lot of people straying from the Lord. Nonetheless, despite Israel shoving the earplugs in, God continues to speak because our God's speaking God and he speaks his gracious words through the prophets. Learn a lot about Elisha. Through his life, we find that the narrator of this historical document includes, I guess, what 21st century ears would say, though, the deeply spiritual happenings and maybe treat with a bit of skepticism. So we hear that Elijah, well, he didn't die, did he? But he was taken up in a whirlwind to heaven. Shortly after, he had parted the waters of the River Jordan. Not once, but twice. (laughs) And then um, we hear that Elisha, who followed on from Elijah, Elijah was his teacher really, he's given a double portion of Elijah's spirit. His spirit there refers to his God-given spiritual power. And with this empowering, we find some, some more amazing supernatural stuff. We find Elisha... Um, superseding Elijah, which these, these things are recorded as history, they happened, we see him making iron axe heads float. As you do, an iron axe head just floating in the water there. We see him purifying contaminated water. That would be handy um, on lads and dads and lads and daughters camping trips that we do in the summer, wouldn't it? Some dodgy water there. Oh, thanks, Elisha. Um, We see him doing that uh, a few chapters after he does it for the first time, purifying deathly stew. Uh, Possibly my favorite uh, story of Elisha pops up in chapter two, where he's just walking along, I guess minding his own business, and he's heckled by a bunch of youths. Um, Today we'd probably picture them sitting there, you know, hoodies up, and they just dislike old people. They don't respect their elders. This is what one translation uh, says that they yell out to him. And I like this because it's, it's pretty antiquated. Um, they say, go up, you bald head. Go up, you bald head. Basically, they're saying, baldy, just, just jog on. You're not wanted here, just jog on. And Elisha, he's like so infuriated by the fact that they don't have respect for their elders and just this immoral behavior. He curses them. The next thing that happens is two bears come down and basically maul 42 of them. It's pretty full on. This is what we're reading. It's history. It's in your face. Lesson for today. Do not ridicule hair loss. (laughs) Amen to that. Uh, Then we see... Elisha producing three specific miracles. And these miracles I've highlighted as specific ones because they act as a foreshadowing of some of the miracles Jesus performs. So one, we see him raising two people back from the dead. This is Elisha, the Old Testament. The second person who's raised back to the dead merely comes into contact with Elisha's dead bones. He's not even living at this. His bones have been thrown in a tomb, dead bodies thrown on top, comes back to life. I mean, just imagine we're to have conversations with our counsellors in in Peckham and say, look, we don't need more defibrillators. What we need are Elisha's dead bones. We'll just scatter them around (laughs) around Peckham. They wouldn't be impressed. But this happened back then. Uh, Two, we see him multiplying loaves of bread to feed 100 people. Then after everyone's had their fill, finding bread left over, 
Sounds familiar, doesn't it? Remember Jesus as he fed the 5,000, then finds 12 basketfuls of broken pieces of bread left over. And then thirdly, Elisha heals Naaman of leprosy, which we know Jesus also does, unafraid to touch a contagious leper. I'll address leprosy a little bit more in a few moments. Now, as I said, these are all foreshadowings of Jesus. Many hundreds of years later, after the days of Elisha, at the beginning of Jesus' public ministry, he stands up at the synagogue in Nazareth, his hometown, and he un unrolls the scroll of Isaiah, and he reads these words, and I'm picking up from Luke chapter 4, verses 18 to 19. So he reads these words from Isaiah. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. He says those words loudly and boldly, and then he rolls up the scroll and he says, Today, this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. And everybody hears that. And they're amazed. You know, some of them, maybe they gave him a little bit of a clap. But then Jesus immediately goes from there to, to become rather personal. And at this point, perhaps some of those who'd given him a little clap start to change their view. And maybe a little bit of hatred creeps in. Sort of like Israel did time and time again with the prophets in two kings. So here's what Jesus says. After he says, this has been fulfilled in your hearing, he then says, truly, I say to you, no prophet is acceptable in his hometown. But in truth, I tell you, there were many widows in Israel in the days of Elijah, when the heavens were shut up three years and six months and a great famine came over all the land. And Elijah was sent to none of them, but only to Zarephath in the land of Sidon, to a woman who was a widow. And there were many lepers in Israel in the time of the prophet Elijah, and none of them was cleansed, but only Naaman the Syrian. When they heard these things, all in the synagogue were filled with wrath. And they rose up and drove him out of the town and brought him to the brow of the hill on which their town was built so that they could throw him down the cliff. But passing through their midst, he went away because it wasn't yet his time. Friends, I believe there is always a danger for us if we're to be attentive disciples and we listen to his word. There's a danger for us. Have we become too familiar with God's word? Do we think maybe that, yeah, he should discipline those out there outside these walls, those who aren't as good as us, but that he shouldn't be disciplining us. Maybe we've forgotten what his voice sounds like. Maybe we've been putting the earplugs in into one area of our lives, and now we're thinking that his voice doesn't have power or recall on the other areas of our lives. The danger for us, ritualistic churchgoers maybe, we come every week, we, we do the home groups as well, is that it can all become routine And we think we know what we're about to hear. And when it's a challenge or when it's a discipline, we say, oh no, I don't need that, not me. I'm one of the faithful ones. Remember, the lessons in 2 Kings is that God is speaking to his people, Israel. And we, fellow brothers and sisters, we're his people. We need to hear what he says. Because even if we do put the earplugs in, He's so wonderful, he continues to speak. And then we find that his words go out to the unlikely places. People like the widow at Zarephath, a non-Jew. People like Naaman, the commander of a Syrian army, not a Jew. People like the apostle Paul, who the day before maybe, or a few days before, he was nodding his head as a Christian was stoned in front of his very eyes. I wonder who you think about when 
I say to you, picture the person in your life most unlikely in your view to become a Christian. The challenge, I guess, or the encouragement is, have we introduced them to God yet? Because we might be surprised. And I sometimes think, maybe before I had become a Christian, the person who told me about Jesus, whether they had ever heard that question themselves, they'd been sitting in a talk and they'd heard, picture the person you think in your life most unlikely to become a Christian. And they thought, yeah, Greg Cushing, definitely not him. <laughs> we don't know, do we? God is gracious. So um, God's grace abounds in unlikely places. I said that there were just two lessons. Second lesson is this. And again, I just think this, this, this waxes in the face from the text. Actions have consequences. Actions have consequences. We read time and time again throughout two kings, words like, they provoke the Lord to anger. And sadly, most often those words, they don't concern the pagan nations. As I've just said, it's, it's to Israel. God is, is saying they. J Judah, they. The descriptions of the kingly reigns, we thought about this in 1 Kings, they're largely depressing reading. Within the northern tribe of Israel, there's not one king who is described as good. Uh, 20 kings, all forsaking the Lord in, in, in really quite creative, yet disgusting ways, such as sacrificing their children. I mean, it's abhorrent. It disgusts us. It's hard reading. Within the southern tribe of Judah, we read of seven kings who break the norm of wickedness. And we think of young King Josiah. What a legend. I think he takes the throne. What is it? Age 12, is it? I think something like that. And he finds the scroll of Deuteronomy. He reads it out, leads to a bit of reform. But even he can't change the tide of wickedness. So despite God being extremely gracious through his prophets, he is also a God of impartial justice and he will not be mocked. We learn that actions have consequences. And as I've mentioned already, we saw that at the beginning of the book with Ahaziah trying to find help in other gods. And God says, you surely die. Likewise, I wanted to pick up on Jezebel. <laughs> and we're going to read about her death in chapter 9. Now, many of you will have heard of Jezebel. Um, even a, a brief read of the Bible, you'll have heard of Jezebel and, and how she was set about trying to, trying to ridicule God in any way she could, ridicule his prophets, put them to death. Anyway, we read this about her death. Chapter 9, verses 30 to 37. And it is pretty graphic, so I'll just say this up front, okay? <laughs> when... Jehu came to Jezreel, Jezebel heard of it and she painted her eyes and adorned her head and looked out of the window and as Jehu entered the gate she said, is it peace, you Zimri, murderer of your master? And he lifted up his face to the window and said, who is on my side, who? Two or three eunuchs looked out at him. He said, throw her down. So they threw her down, horrific, and some of her blood splattered on the wall and on the horses, and they trampled on her. Then he went in and ate and drank. And he said, see now to this cursed woman and bury her, for she is a king's daughter. But when they went to bury her, they found no more of her than the skull and the feet and the palms of her hand. When they came back and told him, he said, this is the word of the Lord, which he spoke to the servant Elijah the Tishbite. In the territory of Jezreel, the dog shall eat the flesh of Jezebel, and the corpse of Jezebel shall be as dung on the face of the field in the territory of Jezreel, so that no one can say, this is Jezebel. Now, as I said, I gave you a warning. It's pretty graphic reading. It feels more like something that should come from a Quentin Tarantino movie. But if you found yourself reading One Kings and Two Kings and thinking to yourself, Man, this woman is horrific. Some of the things she does, will God let her get away with this? That's your answer. And it's brutal. Sin does not go unpunished. And it just makes me think of a verse which, which, which haunts me sometimes. 
uh, Numbers 32, 23, and it's etched up here, your sin will find you out. And it's like, Lord, I, I don't want to hide, I just want to be an open book. I don't want to hide anything for, for, from you or, or try and hide it from others because I know if I do that, then there's going to be potentially this catastrophe where it becomes public. Numbers 32, 23. Good verse to remember. Your sin will find you out. Let's flee from sin, friends. Anyway, I briefly um, want to revisit Naaman as we kind of start coming into land. Uh, Naaman, he lived during the 9th century BC in Syria. He was a big deal. Uh, Chapter 5, verse 1 tells us he was, quote, the commander of the army of the king of Syria and that he was, quote, a great man and that he had, quote, high favor. He was the most decorated figure in Syria, always pictured on the front of the Syrian observer. Back then, he would have featured towards the top of the list of Times 9th century most influential figures. That was our uh, Naaman. Big deal indeed. But he had leprosy. And when we read that, we sh- that should come as a really big shock to us, a huge shock. Certainly within Israel, leprosy was seen as a problem, actually seen as a curse from God. Incredibly contagious, meaning that any leprous Jews needed to be quarantined. But remember, he's not a Jew, he's a Syrian. But friends, that isn't actually the biggest shock. The biggest shock about Naaman is chapter 5, verse 1, quote, by him, by Naaman, the Lord had given victory to Syria. We're told that God had used Naaman to defeat his own people. That's the biggest shock for us. This ongoing war between Syria and Israel, therefore, didn't take him by surprise. And I just flagged this up because hopefully you will have heard time and time again when we were going through COVID, church would have been saying to you, this COVID hasn't taken God by surprise. Nothing takes God by surprise. He knew about Syria's military victories, didn't worry God, he planned them. He's completely sovereign. He's completely sovereign over all of human history like a grandmaster is over a chessboard. But all actions have consequences. And so, you know, I pick up a hot iron with my bare hand. The consequence, I received a nasty burn. Obvious, isn't it? All actions have consequences. But I think we're to learn here that some actions, and this is important, we get this, have divinely raw consequences And it's clear with Ahaziah, as I've already mentioned, it's clear with Jezebel, and it's clear with Syria defeating Israel in battle. That was because Israel had transgressed the Lord. Now, we cannot, friends, forget that God is impartially just, doesn't let people get away with evil forever, and he's the same yesterday, today, and forever. We read of a key verse in Romans chapter 1. This is verse 18. It says this, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who by their unrighteousness suppress the truth. Now, some more liberal scholars, certainly much of the the Western Protestant thinking in the early 20th century, would have claimed that the consequences of sin are only ever cause and effect. So you sin by yelling at your parents, cause, you get a hiding. The effect. You get caught drink driving. Cause, you serve some prison time. The effect and the hot iron, as I've already mentioned. You get the gist. They'll claim that that's just cause and effect. It's the natural consequence without God personally acting in any way. Problem is that the Bible, it does go a bit further than that. Yes, we're told that God has ultimately set a day in the future, known as Judgment Day, when He will make all wrongs right when justice will be served. And that's important to us because we care about justice. But at the same time, we're told in the Bible that he's invested in justice in the here and now, that there's a moral fabric to the universe. He cares. And so that verse in, in Romans chapter 1, verse 18 that I said, says, for the wrath of God 
is revealed from heaven, present tense, is revealed from heaven. God is always involved when justice is administered. Now that's true individually, and it's also true on a larger national scale, despite having a judgment day set in the future. Now, I'd like to close by referring to the pride of the Assyrians. I'm going to close, and then this is going to lead us straight into some discussion questions. And I think it's important because pride is a problem. Certainly a problem in my life, and I'm sure it's a problem in many of your lives, and it's certainly a problem in uh, nations' lives per se. Anyway, we pick up the stories of um, the Assyrians and their pride in chapter 18, just after Assyria has conquered Israel, which we know is God's doing because of Israel's sin. Anyway, then comes Assyria's approach to Judah, the southern kingdom whom God had promised for the sake of King David that he'd never completely destroy. So here's the story. Sennacherib, king of Assyria, sends his, uh, in one of the translations, it, it, it calls them Rabshakei. Um, that basically means chief cupbearer. So he is sent to tell Judah's king, Hezekiah, that Judah's safest bet is to serve Sennacherib and to just you know get in line like all the other nations have and from the context in chapter 18 it sounds like this Rabshakeh this chief cupbearer has come up and he's just outside the city walls of Jerusalem by a pool and as any prideful person does when they're on a bit of an ego trip he starts raising his voice and he starts saying to these Judeans that have come out to meet him look these are the terms you're raising your voice. You need, to, you need to come get in line. And these Judeans, they're worried that other people are going to hear. And so they say, look, please, can you just lower your voice? And can you stop speaking in our language, Hebrew? Can you speak in Aramaic, which was like the, the global business language of the time? But he has none of it. He's full of pride. This is what he says. Chapter 18, verse 28 and following. He says, Then the Rabshakeh stood and called out in a loud voice in the language of Judah, Hear the word of the great king, the king of Assyria. Thus says the king, do not let Hezekiah deceive you, for he will not be able to deliver you out of my hand. Do not let Hezekiah make you trust in the Lord by saying the Lord will surely deliver us and this city will not be given into the hand of the king of Assyria. Do not listen to Hezekiah, for thus says the king of Assyria, make your peace with me and come out to me. Then each one of you will eat of his own vine and each one of you of his own fig tree and each one of you will drink the water of his own cistern until I come and take you away to a land like your own land, a land of grain and wine, a land of bread and vineyards, a land of olive trees and honey that you may live and not die. And do not listen to Hezekiah when he misleads you by saying, the Lord will deliver us. Has any of the gods of the nations ever delivered his land out of the hand of the king of Assyria? Where are the gods of Hamath and Arpad? Where are the gods of Sepharim, Hina and Iva? Have they delivered Samaria out of my hand? Who among all the gods of the lands had delivered their lands out of my hand? That the Lord should deliver Jerusalem out of my hand. That's an ego trip. Yeah. I mean, he's promising things that only God can provide. And God, as I've said, your sin will find you out. He will not put up with such pride. We're told in the very next chapter, an angel of the Lord goes into the Assyrian military camp and kills 180,000 of them. A fearful army becomes a laughing stock. We're told that whilst Sennacherib, the king, is worshipping his God, little G, his own sons come and kill him. Pride always leads to a downfall. But friend, this downfall isn't just cause and effect. It is quite obviously God's doing because our God cares about justice. Well, friends, that is uh, two kings. And I think off the back of reading that, I'm just left with this question or, or this thought. Lord, Right now is the perfect time for, for me to, to, to ask, is there any sin in my life that I need to repent of? And to repent of it right now and treasure your gracious word. And Jesus, I know that you are 
the eternal word. You are the only one who can offer me those things the prideful Rabshakeh was seeking to offer your people. Lord, we come to you. We're sorry for our pride. And we pray that you would help us to learn lessons and see the pointers to you, the perfect son, that we might find our security in you and our joy in our life in you. Amen.